discussion and we'll now have uh, the talk on electoral stakes in Jamaica that will be given by Professor Alvin Wind, a commissioner of the ECJ. Professor Wind is a selected commissioner of the ECJ and professor of international business at UWE, a recent awardee of the Order of Distinction Commander class. He is also Special Advisor on External Relations to the Vice Chancellor of UWE. We now invite Professor Wind to come and give his address. Chairman Archdeacon Thomas, Chair of the ECJ, Director of Elections, Professor Monroe, Executive Director of the National Integrity Action. I'd like to recognize the political leaders that are here with us, uh, MP Shaw, MP Peart, and I know we have several caretakers, and so I really would like to recognize and welcome you, uh, members of the media, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It really is a privilege for me to be here this evening. As our chair indicated, we have been uh, conducting these town hall sessions around the country. Uh, this is the first time I've had the pleasure of participating in a session that incorporates my home parish of St. Elizabeth, so I'm, I'm quite excited uh, to be here. And I want to talk about electoral stakes in Jamaica in the context of our impending electoral season. And really ask the question, what is at stake in our general election contest? In the recent World Championships in Beijing, the world media promoted the competition between Bolt and Gatlin as a competition between good and evil. The issue of good and evil wasn't based upon performance. So the world media wasn't saying that Bolt was good because he had had a series of spectacular performances and Gatlin was evil because he hadn't matched Bolt. The reason the world media was using that designation is because of a concern, a lingering concern, allegations about the fact that maybe one of the participants had not been practicing their sport in a manner that was fair. That was the concern. I want to put it to you today that what is at stake in Jamaica's election is not which party wins the electoral contest. I want to put it to you that there are highly talented people in our political parties. That Jamaica's talent pool is not skewed toward one party or another. That it is randomly distributed, distributed across the political spectrum. So what is at stake is not who wins, but how the game is played. Not who wins, but how the electoral context is conducted. We have recognized this in Jamaica for many years. We have recognized that we must make sure that our electoral contests are administered freely and fairly. In many respects, we made a big push in this process the first time around in 1943. And what happened in 1943 was that we were at, on the advent, on the cusp of universal adult suffrage, where for the first time in Jamaica's history, every Jamaican of majority age would be able to vote regardless of any of their demographic characteristics, their race, their gender, how much money they had, 
we were moving towards a process of making our democracy one in which all of our citizens could participate. But in the context of that process, we established the Electoral Office of Jamaica to run elections. And we wanted the Electoral Office of Jamaica to run elections independently. And we actually had a lot of success in that process, but it wasn't a complete success. Because the Electoral Office of Jamaica was still under the operational guidance and oversight of the party that held power in government. And this is why, in 1979, for the first time in our country's history, we said we have to stop a process whereby our electoral machinery is administered by the incumbent party. That cannot be right. And that is the conclusion that we came to in 1979, and we created the Electoral Advisory Committee, and subsequently in 2006, we formed the Electoral Commission of Jamaica and to have oversight of the electoral process and to incorporate in that process our political parties and individuals who had no political or party allegiance. And that's the process that we have been engaged in for some time. We have to continue to emphasize the importance of making our elections as free and fair as possible. We have to continue to ensure that we understand that there are critical development consequences associated with unfair elections. So if we have a situation where the world at large and the world is watching us believes that our elections aren't conducted freely and fairly, there are consequences for the entire country in that process. The world is far less concerned about which party wins our elections. Uh, just to give you an example of this lack of concern, the, uh, the International Monetary Fund delegation was in Jamaica uh, recently. And in a meeting, the individual in charge of that delegation was asked, in the context of upcoming elections, do you have any concerns about Jamaica's relationship with the International Monetary Fund? And the response of the leader of the IMF delegation was that absolutely not. We will work with whichever political party is chosen by the people of the country. The emphasis of the international organizations is not which party wins, but is the party that assumes governmental authority, is that party the party that is the party of the choice of the people? And if they believe that it is not, then they begin to question the quality of our democracy, and this starts to have implications for the way in which we are treated by our international partners. But of course, even more importantly for us, it has consequences for how we as Jamaicans feel about the political process if we, if we feel we don't have confidence that the party that won the election won the election in a fair, in a transparent way. And this is why we really have to ensure as much as we can that we put in place the mechanisms uh, to, 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 to make sure that this absolutely happens. And this is what we're trying to do. I want to indicate to you that Jamaica is not unusual with respect to the international attention it gets in the electoral process and the administration of that process. The chair indicated that uh, I was recently in, in Mexico observing their midterm elections. Well, she didn't say the midterm elections, but they were the midterm elections. And one of the things that astonished me was that in those midterm elections, and again, these were not presidential elections, but just for the midterm elections, which one would consider to be of maybe somewhat less of a consequence in the presidential elections, there were 400 observers from 61 countries around the world observing that Mexican election, all trying to understand, is the choice of the people reflected in the final ballot count? Are the processes correct? Uh, are they making sure that individuals have free and unfettered access and that there are no issues of impersonation uh, and other challenges? In the Caribbean delegation that visited a number of these polling stations, one of the complaints that we received was a complaint about vote buying. 
that what had happened was that one of the parties was trying to uh, elicit votes um, by uh, means that were illegal. We didn't get many of these complaints, and so it didn't rise to a threshold where there was a conclusion that the electoral process was challenged. But if it had, there would have been consequences um, for that country in terms of uh, global perception, and of course also in terms of how the individuals uh, within the country felt about their electoral process. So, this is why we have spent so much time at the ECJ over the last several years working on issues to try to ensure the best elections that we can have, the lack of opportunities for impersonation, and trying to ensure that there is no undue financial influence in the electoral process, uh, trying to ensure that uh, individuals can't in any way tamper with the electoral administration, trying to ensure that when we look at issues of the boundaries, that boundary decisions are made independently and not in a form where the boundary decisions are seeking to influence the electoral outcome by giving one party an advantage over another. What I would want to say to you all, ladies and gentlemen, today is to continue to join with us in this journey of trying to ensure that our elections in Jamaica are as transparent, as free, as fair as possible. Uh, don't in any way accommodate individuals who are seeking to get you to tamper your, um, your vote or to vote for reasons other than your own conscience. Uh, and we had this skit a while ago about examples of corruption, and those examples are right throughout the country, but we have made a lot of progress, including some of the examples that were identified. We've made a lot of progress in cleaning up our system, and I think we need to have a united position as a country to continue that process so that after an election, we can all go away saying, maybe our party didn't win, and we have hotly contested parties, and there's nothing wrong with contest between parties. There's nothing wrong with party allegiance and party affiliation. It is to be encouraged, but we should all come out of the process saying, regardless of whether our party won or whether our party did not win, Jamaica has won because the voice of the Jamaican people have been heard freely and fairly, and we have selected the party of the majority choice of the country. That is what is at stake in electoral processes in Jamaica. Not who wins the game, but how well, as a country, Jamaica plays the game. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Our next topic in discussion is regulating money in elections to be addressed by Professor Tara Monroe. Professor Monroe is the Executive Director of the National Integrity Action and Visiting Honorary Professor of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of UWI, Mona. He served for 10 years as a senator and was the founding vice president, vice chairman of a citizen's action for free and fair election known as CAFE. Professor Monroe was recently awarded the order of distinction commander class. And we invite Professor now to come and speak on the topic regulating money in elections. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, Archdeacon Thomas, colleagues on the platform, members of Parliament, Shaw and Peart, caretakers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This evening, I'm very happy to be in Mandeville in the parish of Manchester which happens to be the 
birthplace of my dearly departed father, former director of public prosecutions, Hunter Monroe, who was always proud to say that he was born in Comfort Hall in Manchester. But the more so, I'm happy to be here this evening because of this extraordinary turnout. We admired and congratulated the people of Port Antonio and Portland for their turnout a few weeks ago. But I'm told that the register this evening has over 450 members present and I wish to congratulate you. In so doing, I congratulate the Social Development Commission and the Electoral Office of Jamaica, who have been largely responsible for the motivation and the mobilization of those who are here uh, present. And in passing, I want to also congratulate the theatre group of Manchester High School, who did so well a moment ago. Please give them a round of applause. This evening, I've been asked to speak with you on the issue of money in elections. And quite coincidentally, yesterday, September 22nd, 2015, the Daily Gleaner had the following headline on its front page. Campaign financing bill to be in Parliament by next month, Paul Well. In the body of this story, Minister Paul Well, the leader of government business in the House, is quoted as saying, barring any unforeseen issues, we should have the bill in Parliament by October. In the very same story, in the Gleaner, Derek Smith, Member of Parliament and the leader of the opposition business in the House, indicated that the parliamentary opposition was anxious to see the bill tabled in Parliament. We, the citizens, the voters, should also be anxious. We should be anxious for one simple reason. We should be anxious because we are the ones, not secret campaign financiers, who should determine who gets elected. We should be the ones who, after a candidate becomes member of Parliament, we should determine who the candidate looks out for and not some secret campaign financier. We should be anxious because each of us in this room I've heard, I'm sure, have heard the saying, he who pays the piper calls the tune. In a democracy as Jamaica is, we should be the ones calling the tune. Moreover, in a developing country such as we are, we need investment. And if we really want investment from Jamaicans and from foreigners to create the jobs for our young people in particular, to give them work, we need to assure the man who wants to invest his money that there is no favoritism in who gets which contract, in who gets which permit, in who gets what approval for development. Right now, regrettably, ladies and gentlemen, despite the fact that Jamaica is so highly rated on so many indicators like freedom of the press, and we're happy to see Nationwide here covering our town hall meeting, despite the fact that we are so highly rated across the world on that indicator, it is not so on the issue of favoritism in the decision of government officials. The Global Competitiveness Index 2014-2015 rates countries on this indicator, favoritism in decisions of government officials. Do you know where Jamaica ranks on that indicator for 2014-2015 and the years before because 2014-2015 was no different from what happened before. We, this proud nation who rank so highly on freedom of the press, who rank so highly on the independence of our judiciary, we rank number 94 out of 144 countries. Do you know where Barbados ranks? Barbados is at number 52. Costa Rica, number 45. 
You tell me, why should an honest businessman put his money here over Barbados or Costa Rica if there is no level playing field? If the big contributors to campaign election funds are to be considered the favorites, number 94 out of 144 is not where we belong. The bill which Minister Powell says shall be in Parliament by October should contribute to reducing that favoritism and thereby attracting more business and thereby creating more jobs. Perhaps job creation, the most important need in Jamaica today, where one out of every three young persons can find no decent work. And I look at so many young people here this evening who must be concerned as to what they shall be doing after they leave university or after they leave high school. That bill proposed by the Electoral Commission of Jamaica with recommendations debated and approved by Parliament over two years ago. That bill shall be an important step forward without going the whole distance in my view, but nevertheless an important step forward. What does the bill say? The bill shall ban political parties and candidates from receiving the big paper bag or a suitcase full of cash from the anonymous donor. All who give have to declare who they are to the Electoral Commission. The bill shall ban big money from illegal organizations like Cash Plus or Olint. Remember that in 2012, court documents from the Turks and Caicos Island Supreme Court indicated that before the 2007 elections in Jamaica, while Olint was actually closed by the Financial Services Commission, the now convicted financial criminal David Smith, on the basis of what those court documents say, contributed five million US dollars to the Jamaica Labour Party and two million US dollars to the People's National Party. The bill shall ban money being received by parties from foreign governments, whether American government or Chinese government or foreign government entities which could buy influence over our government more than we the people could exert as it should be in our democracy. The bill to be put in parliament by October when becoming law shall compel political parties to disclose to the public who is giving big money. Let me pause to say that many of our most successful businesses and decent businessmen don't need any law to compel them. In 2011, just before the elections, in response to NIA's invitation, a number of very big businesses and corporations declared how much they were giving to both parties because they had nothing to hide. This was their contribution to Jamaica's democracy. This included ICD, it included Sajikor, it included the Bank of Nova Scotia, Grace Kennedy, and GMMB. And we invite them again. And more such companies, in the interest of transparency and letting us, the people, know who is giving who much to who, to declare how much they shall be giving to the parties, even without the law itself having that compelling power. That bill shall also require big government contractors who are paid with taxpayers' money to indicate to which party they are giving how much. The bill, ladies and gentlemen, shall place a limit on how much any single donor can give to a party or a candidate. And that is important. Suppose, for example, as is the case now, you had a businessman or a man giving $15 million to a candidate and the election campaign cost $15 million. The candidate wins. Who do you think I'm going to look out for? You or me or the $15 million man who gave him all the money for his campaign? Or if the election campaign cost the party headquarters, 600 million plus, as was declared in a recent election by the Jamaica Labour Party, or 300 and odd million dollars, as the PNP declared in that recent election, and one or two big people, criminal or commercial, give that money. 
who do you think the party or government will be inclined to look out for? Remember, he who pays the piper calls the tune. The bill shall put a limit on how much a party or candidate can spend in elections so that the party or candidate with less money is not too disadvantaged and the election doesn't become a Christmas spending spree to be followed by a tamarind season. Some of you may not agree because some of you right now are looking for the candidate or the area leader or his representative to come around and check you and pass out a money to get you to vote for him or her. Some of you may even be looking for that now. And I understand the temptation to take it. The times are hard. The times are hard now. They were hard in the past. But remember that too many of us have been doing that over the last 40, 50, 60 years. And where has it gotten us? Where has it gotten us? Has it gotten you a job? Has it gotten you a contract? Has it gotten you water supplies? Has it gotten you security against the criminal? No. And therefore, that's not the way to go. Moreover, I remind you that buying the vote or selling the vote is against the law. And if you get caught, you can either go to prison or pay a fine of up to $80,000. You do the calculation. Work it out in your mind. You get the $5,000. The man you get it from turns out to be an undercover policeman in a sting operation. You go to court and have to pay $80,000. The risk not worth it, sisters and brothers, quite apart from it not getting us anywhere. And the bill finally provides for strong enforcement whereby the Electoral Commission of Jamaica would work together with the Contractor General the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Financial Services Commission, the Broadcasting Commission to monitor and to ensure enforcement of the law. This bill, therefore, is a significant step forward in beginning to regulate money in elections. It has been a very long time in coming. It was in 2002, I remember well, I moved the resolution as an independent senator at the time, and the Senate agreed on both sides that an appropriate regime should be developed for the regulation of campaign election finance. Then it was in April 2005, Prime Minister Patterson, subsequently supported by opposition leader Siaga and Member of Parliament Golding, called for an appropriate regime of party regulation and political funding. And then in April 2006, the Governor General himself in the throne speech indicated that during that legislative year, of 2006-2007, the government, and here I quote, intends to give priority attention to the transparent and realistic financing of political parties and election campaigns. In the last five years, the Election Commission of Jamaica, we have to give them much thanks, has worked hard to come up with recommendations on which there could be broad agreement. They have held meetings with the PSOJ, Citizens Action for Free and Fair Election, the Bar Association of Jamaica, the Press Association of Jamaica. They've held meetings with the Umbrella Group of Churches, Women's Resource and Outreach Center, the Women's Political Caucus, the Bankers Association of Jamaica, the Jamaica Coalition of Civil Society. They've held meetings with National Integrity. And finally, there are no recommendations which the Parliament accepted two years ago. So this bill has been in the making for 12 years. Why, you ask, has it taken so long? One reason I suggest is that our international partners haven't taken it as seriously as they should as a means of helping Jamaica to get rid of corruption in the same way that the IMF has seen it important to work with us in Jamaica in clamping down on discretionary tax waivers, which the Minister of Finance could have given for so many years. They have not given the same attention to this very important issue. Yet, I believe the far more important reason for this matter dragging out so long is this. You and I have to take some blame. 
We, the public, have not seen it important to speak out enough and to stand up for urgent campaign finance regulation. When we speak up, when we stand up together, uptown and downtown, together we get results. So, for example, the last Riverton fire a few months ago in Kingston, poisoning Jamaica's atmosphere. So many people, uptown and downtown, said enough is enough. And as a result of that, the National Solid Waste Management Agency had to change their board of directors. A few years ago, I see some of the older heads here. In the 1970s, an even better example is when, of what can happen when, all, when we all come together to speak out is provided in that time. Prior to 1979, all you women here should note, if a woman got pregnant in Jamaica, she had no right to leave. She could lose her job. After giving birth, she may not have a job to come back to. This was clearly an injustice, crying out for action. A few women said, we are not putting up with this any longer. They spoke out. Then that few became many. In 1978 and 1979, uptown and downtown women came together. Black and brown and white Jamaican women, regardless of politics, they spoke out, they wrote letters, they held peaceful demonstrations, they made representations to the government and to the powers that be. And you know what happened? On December 31, New Year's Eve, 1979, the maternity leave law was passed. Two years of effort, two years of coming together, two years of struggle. Now, today, every woman who gets pregnant is entitled to three months maternity leave and two months of that with pay. That didn't come from sitting down and shutting him out. It came from coming together, speaking out and organizing. Campaign finance reform has taken 12 years so far, whereas it took those women two years. And one main reason is that we have not come together and stood up in the way that our sisters and our mothers and our grandmothers did in 1978-79. We must now wake up. All of us, inside and outside the parliament, and I'm glad to see two parliamentarians here, in town hall meetings like this, we need to understand the urgency and the importance of this bill to regulate money in politics. The time is now to call the talk shows, to write letters to the newspapers, to get your church, your citizens association, your youth club, your professional association to stand up and to speak out. That is how we shall ensure that the bill is tabled in parliament by October. I am not a doubting Thomas, but I am realistic. Because it was on August 20, 2013, over two years ago, that I received a letter from Minister Paulwell in response to my correspondence. And that letter read in part, and here I quote, in respect of campaign financing, my office is in receipt of a submission from the ECJ containing its revised recommendations on campaign financing after the consideration and comments of the members of both houses of parliament. Minister Paulwell's letter concluded, and here I quote, I have since instructed that the said submission be tabled and debated when Parliament resumes sitting in September 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, there may be good reason for that delay, but now is September 2015. And now we need to ensure, not NIA alone, not the ECJ, but you, all of you, PNP, JLP, no P, uptown, downtown, in whose interest it is, we need to ensure that we support the minister in ensuring that that bill is tabled by October 2015 and then passed into law. Remember, without that, it is certain he who pays the piper will call the tune. With that law, we have a chance that we, the people, will call the tune. Thank you very much.